you may wonder why I picked this kind of funny image uh, on the title. Uh, so what I did yesterday is, uh, you know, trying to work out the first problem. So I used an AI text to image generator and I entered the word solid polymer electrolyte. I thought that is an appropriate term for this conference, right? Uh, this is what I got out of it, okay? Uh, so there's a solid polymer and there is probably electrolyte, okay? So this is what we are dealing with um, later tonight, maybe. We'll see. Anyhow, so I'll pick one topic today um, and I, I don't need the motivation why we do that. I think we had a serious number of splendid talks why uh, this is interesting. Uh, so it's really about polyethylene oxide in different variations. Uh, and as we are synthetic chemists, so we try to put a motivation in for this one, why we do this and how we do that. So we make a functional group and convert it into a different functional group. Um, this is sort of the, the chemical challenge. Uh, and I, you know, show you a little bit of this, which then essentially will yield the material of what uh, we like to look at, okay? So solid polar electrolytes, uh, you know, mostly used PO. Uh, this is something you do know. Uh, I don't need to repeat this. But if you use pure PO, obviously, you, you face the problem of, you know, crystallization. We talked a little about, about this one. And, you know, uh, the, the question always is, you know, you can either heat up the temperature to operate or you can try to find ways to prevent crystallization. Uh, and that will help, presumably, uh, the conductivity at lower temperatures. So this is what we look at. Um, and one way to do that is making graft uh, copolymers. There are different aspects in a conference that have looked at this one as well. Uh, here I cited a, you know, an example of a uh, colleague in, in, in Bayreuth who made essentially PO graft block polymers based on a methylcholate uh, macromonomer approach. You can easily polymerize this one and use that, works pretty fine. But it does contain another uh, functional group in there, which is an ester unit. So now you're having ether units from the polyethylene oxide you have ester units, and that's two chemically different entities, and it's very hard to differentiate how, they, how those behave in an electrochemical cell in terms of degradation and so on and so forth. So we said, okay, why not making... Uh, uh, this battery is running out. Well, this should not happen at the battery conference. Uh, so why not making a sidechain system which is all ether-based? Get rid of the, poly, uh, of the ester units, uh, and that's sort of the polymer structure that you see uh, about here. This is sort of our target molecule. Um, they haven't necessarily been described in literature, and the question always, you know, what would be the, the, the best architecture? So you can draw a lot of interesting questions in the beginning as a synthetic person, uh, you know, what would be the challenge in here? So this is where Andreas uh, came into the game. Uh, so if you make side chain structures on a, on a you know, a polymer backbone, uh, you can vary the side chain lengths, and the question is, how long should the PO be? What is, is there an ideal length? Uh, should they all be identical? Is a mixture better? Uh, what is the length influence of the backbone? How densely grafted should the PO chains be? Um, and of course, lit lithium salt, we talked about this one plenty during the conference. I'm not going to touch this today. It's all questions you could dial in and then see what the response on the conductivity would be. Okay. So we, we decided to go for excuse me, uh, for statistical copolymers where we have a PEO sidechain and another block to maintain a little bit of the stability uh, and to keep the synthesis a bit easier, okay? Now, when you do such copolymers, uh, you can always take two monomers, macromonomer and a regular monomer, and do copolymerization and very other things. But the problem is if you repeat the synthesis two times, you get two different samples. They are not identical. And this is always a bit uh, difficult in particular when you change the length of the PEO, the composition dramatically may change. We have seen this also in the talk for the polyoxazolins that there uh, is different changes in the copolymerization parameters. So this is a bit of a challenge. So we thought you know, we need to come up with a different strategy. And this is sort of what my group has a certain expertise in. So we can do a modification of an existing polymer backbone. So we d divide the synthesis in two steps. We first make the polymer backbone and then we attach uh, at this blue side, essentially, whatever function unit we would like to do. And this red unit now could be the PEO chain, okay? Uh, the advantage would be that independent of the chain lengths that we add here, this is driving me a bit crazy, uh, we do not alter anything of this chain lengths here, okay? This is an important part. So it's, you know, one precursor system, and then you divide it into multiple pots uh, and, and get different polymers with varying side chain lengths. Uh, for polyethers, uh, polyvinyl ethers, um, 
there hasn't been a chemistry out there that allows you to attach PO to the system, so we have to you know, think a little bit about it. And this is the monomer that uh, Andreas came up with. Take a vinyl ether system, you do copolymerization, have a tosylate in the side chain as a reactive unit that you can displace by a nucleophile, for example, an hydroxyterminated PO. We make a statistical copolymer, we, ins we inscribe the ratio of these two units precisely, we don't touch it anymore from now on, okay? It's always the same. And then we attach different chain lengths of the PO here, varying from 400 gram to 2000 gram per mole, because that's what is commercially easily available, so we stayed with this one uh, for the time being, okay? Um, so essentially, we vary the chain lengths here, but we keep that ratio constant uh, for the time being. Uh, you can really show, you know, chemically that this conversion works quantitatively. So for the non-chemist, I apologize uh, for, for these structural details. But essentially, uh, the, the protons from that reactive unit here, the tosyl part, the aromatic units show up here, and after the conversion, they completely disappeared. Okay, this is an indication that we get a quantitative conversion in here to really have a system that is in there, and, and molecular weights still say pretty fine. You get an increase in molecular weight as we want, but not really necessarily a broadening of the chain. So we really have a system in hand that looks quite nice. So what we have now is a system that the backbone is identical, the ratio is identical, and we only vary the number of ethylene oxide units in the side chain. So if you calculate this was in EO units, well, this is what you get from 11 to about 54. And now you have something to play with relatively to the lithium ion ratio and see how these systems behave uh, in, in, in terms of parts. So uh, thermal uh, stability is pretty good. Uh, you can see the TGA data here for the systems. You know, above 300 uh, is sort of where slowly degradation starts, but you know they're, they're pretty stable uh, for this. Very good. Uh, the glass transition temperature, uh, if you can detect it, sometimes a bit difficult, is about 65 degrees centigrade for you know pure uh, systems in there. Um, we do see a melting point of the side chain, in particular for the longer side chains. Um, so the longer the chain, the more likely a crystallization is. So there is a certain cutoff. Uh, but this all changes as soon as you add uh, lithium salt. Okay, um, then you know we can completely uh, avoid any of crystallization, but it affects uh, the glass transition temperature. And this is what you see here. Uh, for example, for one system with the longest side chain, you know, depending on your lithium ethylene oxide content ratio the glass transition changes, okay? So we do have what we call a quasi-ionic cross-linking in the system, and that alters uh, the glass transition temperature. Um, and I really highlight this one because the more cross-linking you have, the higher the TG is, and this is a factor that comes into the game more and more often because cross-linking density, I think, is something very important to control. So this is something uh, to really have a look at. Um, so this is nice. Uh, how do they... Uh, you know, conductivity data behaves. So we, we screen different uh, lithium and ethylene oxide ratios, which you can see here. Uh, so one to five is definitely the worst, no matter what side chain lengths you take. Um, this is, it becomes pretty obvious. Uh, one to 15 and one to 20 are very similar. Uh, so that here you can you know, pick what you prefer. Uh, however, for the longest side chain at one to 20, you, you do see again that side chain crystallization kicks in. So that's also a limitation in here. So if you look at the data here, the green dots, you can see here the decline of the duration of the VTF curve behavior due to the crystallization. So this is something where, you know, quite quite some stuff is what we learned. Intermediate conclusions. Um, there is no system, one that suits all. It really depends on what you would like to have because different factors are uh, not necessarily in line with each other. Uh, so we have the side chain lengths, the density, and of course the quasi cross linking density, and we excluded for now, of course, the plasticizing effect of the counter NI. This is very nice. So we learned something, but these systems are practically useless because they're mechanically not necessarily stable. So that they're not really solid in that sense that you can make a freestanding membrane out of this one. But I'll come back to this one in a minute because we learned a lot on how we can optimize the conductivity in these side chain systems. I want to take a different twist um, to come back to the question I just asked before coffee break. Apologies again for that, that I stole half of your coffee break, uh, but I, I want to answer you why I was interested in that one. Because we made a very interesting uh, architecture. Well, let's say this gentleman here, Martin, made this one. I didn't do that. Um, on making a cage-shaped PO of that structure. Okay. Now, 
in such a topology, at least to my understanding, it is forbidden that you can make a helical PO chain in the system. It doesn't work. Okay, The topology forbids you that. So it would be very interesting to look at that. The nice thing is, um, this really shows up also in the conductivity data, and I really learned something today about my own experience that I tried not to, to discuss in the paper. So what you see here is the uh, you know conductivity data of linear PEO in green. In orange, the precursor star, uh, which has exactly the same chain lengths, uh, uh, molar mass relatively to the cage uh, system. Okay. So the, the star and the linear system in orange and in green are pretty much in line. Um, so in contrast to a Laurent's set, setup, here we do not necessarily see the difference between the star and the linear system. And I'm wondering what this is the case. But as soon as you form the cage, you can see that's the blue data you get here. Okay. There is no crystallization taking place anymore. Um, that obviously has to do with the architecture. But the, the conductivity is lower uh, for the higher temperature parts. So this is what I really think, this is the difference on, you know, the forbidden part that you cannot make a helical structure maybe. Well, that's something interesting to look at, but I will send samples to Vito and then he can figure that one out for us. And that would be pretty interesting. So this is very nice, uh, interesting to play with the architecture. Again, not necessarily a helpful system, very expensive to make, um, and not mechanically stable, but interesting in itself to learn about the ionic conductivity in here. And that brings me now to the next part. In order to make it useful, you need to make it solid. So how do you solidify the system? And you know, we have seen multiple approaches to this one, and I want to learn something from you now, okay? Because everybody uses the benzophenone cross-linking system for PEO. And I don't understand it, okay? Um, I understand an experiment never lies, so it does cross-link, it does work. But I think you know nothing about the cross-linking density, and that's a bit of a problem, okay? Why do I think so? You know, I learned something from literature, but I just put this out as a reference to, uh, you know, sort of uh, underline my own thinking. If you use benzophenone, uh, this is essentially what's going to happen. You excite the molecule, you have PO present, you abstract a CH bond in here, you get the radical at the PO chain in there. And then this radical is supposed to do something that should end up in a cross-linked system. Well, it does so because if two of the neighboring chains by chance have a radical, you get a radical coupling, and that will yield into a cross-linking system. This is the reaction you want, I understand, uh, but it's not very efficient because the first reaction is going to take place that you get the covalent bond between two, these two radicals. They are the closest neighbors. This is the first carbon-carbon bond you form, and then that's it. You get a CH insertion, but you don't get a cross-linking. Okay? So this is essentially only a side reaction. But it's nice. Um, but the problem is it's not the only side reaction. Okay? There's another one, which is the same scission. This bond here can cleave homolytically. You form an aldehyde and another radical. Okay? So this radical, of course, can do a cross-linking again, but you have done the same change scission before, so you don't change the cross-linking density at all. And now I don't understand you know, what the overall cross-linking density in such a film is. Uh, the only way to get this is because you use very high benzophenone contents, 5 mol percent or, or 8 percent or whatever. So you just exhaust the system to make sure you get sufficient of these bonds. But you get plenty of other reactions as well, and I don't know whether this is helpful. So that's something I would like to learn, and you, you can throw stones at me at dinner, okay? Um, I'm, I'm happy to take those. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we do something else. We don't do chemistry. We use polymers, and I think Laurent um, already, you know, uh, enlightened this one perfectly for me, so I don't need to use too much of the time. It's really about making structures of, of that nature here, okay? Uh, isolating the ion conducting phase from a mechanically stabilizing phase, okay? Uh, and that's relatively simple to achieve. You do not need any photochemistry afterwards. You really first make a bit of material. You can characterize it. You know exactly what you have. And then in a processing, uh, in a thermal way, you can get to stable membranes. So what we do is we use a PO sidechain system. We learned a lot from the first project. Uh, we learned that the vinyl ethers are nice to make, but not really the most feasible system. So we changed to styrene-based systems. Again, all ether-based. Uh, and then styrene as a second block, because this has a glass transition temperature around 100 degrees centigrade. So anything up to 90 plus degrees centigrade, we have stable films. Okay. Um, so we get a dipolar polymer, ion conducting block, and the you know mechanical stabilizing block. 
we can play with the side chain lengths, but we need to make sure that the volume ratio of these blocks is about 50-50, so that we get a lamellar phase um, where we can look at this. Uh, we can confirm the lamellar phase. Looks very nice uh, from, from the you know, scattering data in here. Uh, this is how the film looks like. So it's really a mechanically freestanding membrane without any other post-processing in there. Uh, you can look at the conductivity, of course. That depends on the chain lengths, depends on the temperature, the typical thing of what you would achieve. And you can really characterize the mechanics. Okay, This is the data here, uh, rheology data for just uh, the, the, homo, the homopolymer Without the polystyrene, as soon as you put in polystyrene, you can see that you get a ramp up of at least five magnitudes of order uh, in, in the G prime and G double prime values. So it's a really change in the mechanics dramatically, and that's what uh, we can utilize. And um, you know, of course, conductivity data looks still very good, even though now you have 50 volume percent of something else in there. Uh, but it's just there in order to uh, provide the mechanics. Um, you can make full cells out of this one. Uh, so Andreas did this un against NMC 622, and you can see the cycling data in here. Uh, it looks, at least for us as synthetic people, uh, quite good and promising. Uh, there is a C-rate dependence, as you know, typically. But all in all, this looks like a very helpful and promising thing. So we like that. Um, and then, of course, this is now an all-solid system. There has been a lot of discussion going on you know, between all-solid, a gel, quasi-solid and all kind of intermediate terms. Now, I'm an IUPAC guy. You probably realized this one during my questions as well. There's a lot of terms that are not really perfectly defined yet. So this is, I think, uh, homework for all of us in the coming years. So uh, something to look at. Anyhow, uh, we added also plasticizers, either ionic liquids or oligoethylene oxide chains. You can do the same thing. And essentially, this helps you to increase, of course, the conductivity while still maintaining the, the freestanding membrane in the system. And Chairman is getting uh, nervous, uh, and you're getting probably hungry. Uh, so just one last thing, and I'm, I'm happy that Fabian uh, is, is in the room, of course, because we collaborated and we used the same polymer now for different uh, ion conductivities, not only for lithium, but also for sodium and potassium. And the interesting thing is they don't really differ much. We don't understand why, but that's what it is, okay? It's interesting, and we can really make what well, we means Fabian and his his group members um, can make you know rather stable cells out of this one as well here for the for potassium and for the sodium cycling. So I think it's a, it's a rather potential polymer system out there, being maybe slightly universal in the wind. So a lot of things we can learn and look at in in the future, and I'm happy uh, to discuss more with that. Now I haven't done anything, uh, but what I wanted to show you is you can really you know play with the PO as is. Uh, making different polymers on the precision in its architecture. So synthesis is a door opener for applications, I would say. Uh, and I think what I will happy to discuss with over lunch. Again, I haven't done anything of the work. I have to thank my group uh, who are active in the lab, funding ages for supporting us to do the work. And I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions you have now or during dinner, uh, but stones, please save for later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick.